Chapter 17 of The Wonderful Flight to the Mushroom Planet. Nothing but a tinkle in the wind. Now, as they neared the beach, David speeded up the motor in order to counteract the pull of gravity. The little ship, desperately trying to struggle upward in the direction its nose was pointed, and yet drawn in inescapably downward by gravity, fairly shuddered in the conflict between the these opposing forces. For a second, they were poised just above the sand. Then David turned off the motor and down they came. <gasps> they were safe. Belts were snatched off, the door was wrenched open, and there, waving and calling, his long, funny gray gardening coat flapping and whipping about his knees, just exactly as it had the last time they'd seen him, was Mr. Bass hurrying toward them along the dim beach. And what a broad and happy smile was on his face. Mr. Bass, Mr. Bass, we did it. We did everything. And there was a storm, Mr. Bass, but we got through. And we saved the Basidiumites, Mr. Bass. We took Mrs. Pennyfeather. She's a chicken, and she was our mascot. Just think, Mr. Bass, if it hadn't been for Mrs. Pennyfeather. But surely little Mr. Bass was about to be blown away. Surely that tiny figure, frail as a dried leaf, could not withstand the onslaught of the wild wind a moment longer. Come down, boys, come down, welcome home. Oh, what a triumph, a great triumph. How proud I am of you, but I knew you would do it. Do come down at once so that we can talk. The rock was some distance off, and so, each with his big bag of food, the boys jumped out and tumbled on the sand at Mr. Bass's feet, laughing and gasp gasping. Eagerly, he put an arm around each, then joyfully shook their hands. And so beaming was his smile and so proud his eyes that they were made to feel like the first and greatest explorers of all time. A triumph, he exclaimed again. I had never a moment of doubt, only I regret the storm. That, Chuck and David, I will have to admit, gave me pause for thought. Were you frightened? Oh, I do hope. But how strange, for now that it was all over, it seemed to the boys to have been the most terrifically exciting experience they had had, except landing on Basidium. Why, it was nothing, Mr. Bass, just nothing at all. That is, it was, it was stupendous, finished Chuck. That, and the moment we landed, and the moment we found that Mrs. Pennyfeather's eggs had what the Basidiumites needed, and the moment we, the moment we met Ta. Remember that, Chuck? And remember how he, how he gave us his necklace. Oh, Mr. Bass, you must see it, you must. But little Mr. Bass put, his, put back his head and gave a long, thin, high, airy laugh. He laughed and laughed. Then he laid a hand on the arm of each of them. My dear boys, he said, I have so little time. I had to welcome you, no matter what else happened. But first, before I leave you, I must take with me that bottle of Basidium air. Do you have it? he asked and you could see the excitement, the almost boyish excitement that shone in his great round eyes. What a good thing it was to have that bottle for him, thought David, watching Chuck rustle around in his bag. Yes, there it was. There was the canning bottle full of basidium air. And in the gray morning light, how positively unearthly it looked sitting there on Chuck's hand, where it shone like a jewel of precisely basidium green. That lovely, luminous, bluish green that David knew he could never forget, no matter how long he lived. Ah, breathed Mr. Bass. He took the bottle in his thin, almost transparent fingers and held it up and gazed at it as though it were a long lost friend. Then quickly, he unscrewed the lid, took a breath and popped the lid back on before you could say Jack Robinson. Oh my, he whispered, that smell. Why, it takes me back thousands of years. Would you believe it? The boys gasped and stared. Thousands of years, did you say, Mr. Bass? Ventured Chuck, thinking surely he had been mistaken. Goodness, yes. Why, just one whiff wafted me over the centuries as though they had been nothing. Carefully, Mr. Bass tucked the bottle inside his coat and then buttoned the coat up so that the bottle made a funny sort of bulge on his wispy figure. Then he held out a hand to each of them. Boys, he said very solemnly, you must get your rest now. And then I should like you to meet me at my house at, mm, let's say 10 o'clock. 
Yes, I believe 10 o'clock would be just right if there is nothing else you must do. Then I can have a full account of your journey with nothing skipped down to the last detail. And perhaps by then I shall have the results of my analysis of Basidium air. Shall we say 10 then? Yes, Mr. Bass. Oh, yes, but Mr. Bass, why do you have to hurry away? cried David. Can't we talk now? We're not in the least tired. Ah, but you will find you are, David, very tired. By 6.30 you will be sound asleep and you will be sunk deep in at least, and you will be sunk deep until at least nine. Meanwhile, I have a great deal to do. Oh, a great deal. You see, I have an appointment, the most important appointment of my life, and I must be ready. When is it, Mr. Bass? asked Chuck. Well, said little Mr. Bass, I'm not just sure, but it will be soon, of that I am certain. I've thoroughly cleaned my house for the first time in, ah, hmm, hmm. Well, some weeks, shall we say, and I have most of my papers in order, but there are still quite a few things to be done. The most important appointment of his life, and he wasn't certain when it was to be. Are you afraid, Mr. Bass? asked David, remembering vividly that moment when he had pulled back the stick and pressed the button just before they had set off for Basidium. Afraid? Dear me, no, smiled Mr. Bass in surprise. Why should I be afraid? Well now, Chuck and David, I must hurry. 10 o'clock then, you won't forget, will you? As if they could possibly forget. Away went Mr. Bass, and as he scurried off down the beach, it seemed to the two boys standing there looking after him that the fitful wind suddenly rose in force. Did his hurrying feet touch the sand? Now he disappeared round the other side of the big rock, and with Mr. Bass gone, weariness overtook them, or perhaps they felt their tiredness for the first time. Now that Mr. Bass wasn't there, it seemed to David that, the, that an electric current had been shut off. Battered by the wind, the two boys once more hauled up their heavy bags of food and staggered away across the beach. We ought to put the spaceship back in the cave, Chuck, shouted David. And yet, at the thought of hauling that big, heavy thing up over the sand, he felt he couldn't make it, even with the help of the carrier, which was still there. Can't, shouted back Chuck. We'll just have to... And then the wind died, and there was Chuck shouting furiously into silence. We'll just have to leave her there for now, he finished in an ordinary voice, looking rather foolish. Guess it's far enough back from the wave line, murmured David, turning to look at their ship glimmering silver gray in the early morning light. Tide's going out, I think. She'll be all right. Now they plugged ahead again in a kind of queer, ominous stillness. Boom, roared the churned up ocean. Then the wind gathered itself and plunged up the coast again and all the ancient little cypress trees shivered and shook, and the pines joined their voices with the seas. At the parting of the ways, the boys scarcely paused. See you later, Dave. I'll be over about a quarter of 10. Gotta do some sleeping first. David climbed tiredly toward his back gate, and when he passed John and Mrs. Pennyfeather's house, he had a funny little feeling of sadness. Just think, he said to himself, Mrs. Pennyfeather was way out in space, 50,000 miles away, on a planet no earthly bird or person had ever seen, except himself and Chuck, and Mr. Bass, in a way. A shiver went through him. Was it the wind? Then he realized something. Ever since he and Chuck had waked up, they'd been speaking English. He knew that. And he knew that before they'd gone to sleep after leaving Basidium. They'd still been speaking words that were not English. Now he tried to reach back in his memory for snatches of that strange, faraway tongue. How had he and Chuck spoken to Ta and his two wise men? What was the word, for instance, for ground or for mountain or for water? He hadn't the faintest notion. All he could recall now was that they had spoken in a kind of sing-song way, with the words going up and down as the Chinese speak, and in thin, high-pitched voices. He stared at the hen house, making an enormous effort to remember just one word. That was all he asked, just to get back one word. But his mind was blank. His memory held nothing but far off sound of little high voices like a tinkle of glass in the wind. This was all that was left. 
almost, he might never have been on Basidium. Oh, but I was there, he exclaimed aloud. And now he started toward the house again. I was there. Chuck and I were there, and we're going back. In another 10 minutes, David had crept in at the door, put all his food away, folded up the big brown bag, slipped out of his clothes and into his pajamas, and was curled in a roll with the blankets pulled up snugly under his chin. He lay there in his bed listening, absolute stillness, and then a screen slammed suddenly against the outside of the house. Now it was ripped from its fastenings and sent crashing and banging helter-skelter away down the sidewalk. And the house was shaken by the wind as though it were about to be loosed from its foundations. The giant with the bowling ball sent one of them booming across the skies so that the rumble echoed away and away over the mountains. Then the rains came down, slashing and streaking against the windows. The Basidium, whispered David, I want to go back. Must go back right away. Then he was asleep. And even when one of those black bowling balls sped across the sky and hit another square on right over his roof, he did not move. 